Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Patinsky. I am the CEO of Parchment, which is a digital credentials company. And I have the pleasure of being the moderator for this panel, which, uh, to make sure you are in the correct room, is Trust But Verify, Blockchain Knowledge as a Currency. Um, and we really do have a fantastic panel uh, to take us, through, uh, take us through this topic. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you to just briefly introduce yourselves, please. That'll actually uh, protect me from mispronouncing names now that I think about it. <laughs> and Michael, you're going to go first, but I should mention, if Michael does step out at the way end a few minutes before the session is over, it's nothing that any of us said. Uh, <laughs> it is literally a very, very uh, tight time frame to, uh, to make a flight. So with that, may Michael, maybe you'll kick us off, do quick introductions, sure. and then we'll dive right in. Good. So Michael Casey, I'm a senior advisor at the Digital Currency Initiative, which is based at MIT's Media Lab. Antonis Polamidis, I am the CEO of the University of Nicosia. Uh, we have a fairly extensive uh, academic effort in blockchain that we've been running for the last four years. My name is Chris Jaggers, co-founder of Learning Machine, and we help institutions issue official records in a format that's tamper-proof, recipient-owned, and instantly verifiable. My name is Alex Gregg. I'm a senior advisor to the Minister for Education and Employment in Malta. Uh, I also teach at the University of Malta. And I'm Marley Gray. I'm principal architect at Microsoft, um, overseeing our blockchain platform and uh, building a platform for other people to build applications on top of. Great, great. So again, you see we have a tremendous panel, some of whom are working with blockchain in the context of education broadly or credentialing specific, and some of whom are not. They're just dealing with blockchain across a number of different sectors. Since this is an education conference, I believe in setting out learning objectives. Uh, so my uh, learning objectives for this session is first to provide folks with a primer on the blockchain. My sense is that there are, well, let me ask this question. How many people would describe themselves as, as fairly knowledgeable about blockchain and then I'm going to ask the reverse, which is how many people are really in this session to get oriented and to get a primer on the blockchain? So let's start with how many folks consider themselves pretty literate on blockchain? Okay, so there's a lot of bright lights, but I see about five or six people. And how many people would say that you really are looking for that primer, that opportunity to understand blockchain and its applications? Okay, so a few more in that, actually many more in that bucket. So I think we've we frame this right. So our learning objectives are to provide a primer on the blockchain. Uh, I want to make sure that my questions bring out the current state of play when it comes to applying blockchain to credentialing. And then also talk a little bit about what the implications are. Are there winners? Are there losers? What does the world look like when the blockchain uh, is playing a, a central role in how we issue and verify uh, credentials? So th those are our learning objectives. And Michael, I'm going to start it off with you, um, especially with that first learning objective. And maybe you could be the one who gives us that primer. So what is the blockchain or a blockchain? A blockchain. I'm not sure how I should phrase that. And how is it distinct from Bitcoin, which sometimes people use those two very interchangeably? And if you could weave in, what are some of the applications beyond Bitcoin that folks are beginning uh, to apply blockchain to, I think that distinction will be even more concrete. Right, so I'll, I'll take up the full 50 minutes and then we'll... <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> if you could do that, yes. Yeah. Five minutes <laughs> of the and dance. Okay. Well, I, actually, we were talking about this last night, about how this, this challenge. Um, and um, I think, first of all, you're right to say the or a. I think what I demand is an article. Choose one. The or a. Don't use... No data. I don't like blockchain as a generic. Right? It needs to have an article in front of it. Um, so first of all, I think one of the things we talked about last night is like, you don't necessarily need to fully grasp the ins and outs of this, but people seem to feel compelled to do so. So I want to ask another question of the audience. Who knows what uh, the transmission control protocol is? Uh, yep, there's a few people, but there's not a majority. That's actually not a bad turnout for an education audience. I would have thought it would be actually probably a little bit less. TCP, uh, along with IP, the internet, internet Protocol, are the pair of protocols that basically run the internet. Um, and so we happily go about our lives sending emails, using websites, getting on with it, without really necessarily, no people don't even know this thing exists, and yet it's critical to how we go about 
dealing with uh, transfers of information across the internet. I would suggest that we're going to get to a world where the blockchain is going to be the same. It's a fairly complicated piece of technology. So to know the basic, the real ins and outs of it is a bit of a challenge. There's lots of different resources you could go to to, to dig deeply into that. Um, I wrote a book about Bitcoin. If you want to uh, read up on that, it's called The Age of Cryptocurrency. There's, a, there's the plug. Um, but you could, uh, I think the most important thing is to really come to terms with why it matters. What is the actual architecture and structure of this this way of approaching information, this data structure that uh, changes things and why that's important, right? So the key thing to remember about the blockchain, um, certainly when we use the, the, the definite article, we typically talk about the Bitcoin blockchain, but it is, a, it is the distributed ledger that allows Bitcoin to occur. What do we mean by that? We mean that rather than having the source of record of transactions reside in one server controlled by one company, it resides on multiple computers, and in Bitcoin's case, by any computers. Um, and uh, th it's a permissionless environment. Anybody can enter into this environment and um, what we do, what we call validate the network. They are miners. They are keeping track of transactions and validating their auth authenticity. And they do so with some pretty important cryptographic tools and some, a, a variety of game theory concepts and so forth which compel them and guide them toward reaching a consensus even though they don't necessarily know that they could trust each other. And this is a really critical point. There's, a, there's this value in the security of that and the way it's designed. I'm going to just give you a little bit of an example about how this works. I'm going to take this pen here. I'm going to look at all of you. For now, you are all miners. You are, each one of you, uh, you have your own ledger. You're keeping a, a track of this common record, but you're all doing it individually. This is the way the system works. And you're going to witness a transaction. I'm going to take this pen here. I'm going to hand it to Antonis. And I'm going to declare that this is actually a transfer of property. He now owns this. All right? You are all witnesses to this, um, and you're now recording this in your ledgers. If I wanted to reverse that transaction, right, to, 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 to change this whole thing, I'd have to go to each one of you now and bribe you or convince you or do something to make you disavow this fact. That's the actual essence of the challenge of, of, of the, the Bitcoin solves, right? It's, it's this immutable ledger. It's immutable because the act of undoing the record is extremely expensive and for various reasons it gets really expensive, really complicated, really difficult to do. So we create this quality of immutability and that's very powerful because it's not just an important facet of how we transfer money uh, because we need to have this immutable record of when uh, a currency has been transferred to one person and isn't being double spent. But it can also keep track of all sorts of other records. So some of the other applications, Matt, are things like property records, right? So the idea of a title to property, we think, could be embedded into a blockchain transaction. This is, after all, just software. You can embed other information into it. And then the transfer of that title now is being witnessed by this same collective group in this immutable sense. So we now have potentially a much more reliable registry of property and asset transfers than we do in, say, places where they've got these paper records and, and officials who could be corrupted in some way, right? So there's this security component to that. And it starts to become pretty powerful. And you'll hear about the way that this is being done for certificates and, and for, for academic records because we can now create this immutable, trusted, uh, record of, of events and, and, and of, of claims and attestations. So, so that's really the principle behind it. There's a lot of other things people are doing. They're talking about putting identity, uh, concepts of identity onto the blockchain. We are, there's people are using them to manage supply chains. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of talk about distributed energy, energy uh, communities, microgrids, trading uh, energy across in a decentralized manner with nobody controlling the ledger in the middle, middle of all that. So there's a range of different applications. And I'll just make one distinction here. So this is, this is the ledger that, that is part of Bitcoin. So when we talk about the blockchain, we typically see it as the Bitcoin blockchain. It is a permissionless blockchain. Anybody can enter. They get rewarded with Bitcoin for the purposes of carrying out this validation. And there's various ways in why, why this works. But there's this, and there's, there's other permissionless blockchains. Ethereum is one of them. There's another one. There's various others as well. But there's this new concept called a permissioned blockchain, yep. which um, you know, is, is, in some respects, a, a blockchain light. Uh, it, it certainly embraces this idea of the distributed ledger. It typically has cryptographic tools to keep certain security, and it typically has a consensus mechanism by which all these computers kind of independently come to an agreement on what the facts are. But to participate in that ledger, you're permissioned by some central authority of some sort. That might be the consortium that runs it, it might be a company in its own right. 
And that starts to, like, if you like, shift the goalpost a bit, make, make the system potentially a little bit more corruptible because you could argue that you could now reach that central authority and have all these nodes change the record. That doesn't mean it's not a viable option. It means that there's, there's a lot of, it, it resolves some of the fundamental problems <coughs> with a permissionless system, but it does raise those issues. And so there's this big debate right now and a lot of focus on how we might reach the, the benefit of a public blockchain. And I would argue that that's the comparison to the internet. TCP IP is an open protocol, everybody uses it, versus a permissioned blockchain, which sometimes call a private blockchain, which you, know, you might think of as the intranet, right? Like it's, a, it's an internal network. And, and these are, you know, and, and the internet obviously beat intranets. Uh, so, you know, some of us, like me, like to see the notion that a public blockchain is going to win through this process. Great. Hopefully that gets us You have a set a very full table. <laughs> Marley, I'll, I'll put you a little bit on the spot. Anything you would add to that? You're about to go to the Microsoft Developers Conference. What are some of the applications that you expect to talk to developers yeah, about? We're just scratching the surface. Um, you know, we talked about the, the plumbing, and, and we say just the, the blockchain and the cryptographic techniques or like TCP IP, and uh, it's been around for quite some time, but the real revolution were the protocols that were built on top of it. Uh, SMTP gave us email, HTTP and uh, HTML gave us web pages, and we can go on and on and on, POP3, and you can go across and look at all these different protocols, and what we're gonna see is um, we're, we're, we're trying to build a platform. One of the problems with this is it's so hard to, uh, the technology is complex. It's hard to build applications uh, based on this technology because the tools aren't there. There's no maturity in that space. <clears throat> so we're working with lots of industries in financial services, healthcare, uh, government. Um, uh, we're talking in, in, in education. Um, identity is, is huge. Um, and we're trying to say, what are the missing pieces? What, what's going to be that enabling piece to allow people to start building these types of solutions and we say you know uh, you know we would never have dreamed in 1995 that there would be a Facebook and it would have such social implications and the time it took from 95 to get to where Facebook's impact was we think is going to is going to shrink um, with blockchain and we're going to get to the point where we have this mixture of technologies um, that revolutionize not only industries specifically but cross industry where we have healthcare and finance working together to, to ease the patient provider uh, payer uh, problem. Um, so, you know, we're busy working trying to build the platform for people to, uh, to start building real world apps on top of it. Instead of just cryptocurrency, they have a wallet, there's this Bitcoin. Uh, those aren't very interesting, there's actually quite simple use cases. Um, so there's, there's a lot to do, we're early on, um, but the, the thing that we're looking at is uh, and, and we'll come to the attestation pieces here uh, pretty soon, but really it's, we have been, um, you know, sometimes you, you start to build a product and you have to go drum up uh, interest in, in product or strategies. And we have been wholly inundated since 2015, since we announced that we were just doing the, the basic uh, infrastructure to let people start playing with private blockchains to start tinkering with it. Because lots of people were sort of nervous to say, oh, I'm gonna go on the Bitcoin network and build an app because you expose yourself to all this uh, uh, untrustlessness. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're making a safe place to go. So it's, it's really interesting uh, across industry. Yep. So you, you've given me a good segue for, for Andonis. So this is early on, and you know, but there's a lot of interest coming in. And sometimes with technology, we can sort of have solutions in search of a problem. Um, and, and finding that right kind of match. So as we move into education and credentialing in particular, you know, you lead a university. What is the problem that you saw blockchain as the potential solution for? Sure, let me answer this in two ways. I'm gonna first answer it with my hat of, I was one of the founders of our digital currency and blockchain initiative at the university, and then the question you actually asked, which is how does it impact my day job running the administrative functions of the university? As a university as a whole, we're immensely bullish about the use of blockchain in general. We probably have the highest level commitment of any university to this space. We started in the very scary years. We announced that we would accept Bitcoin for tuition in 2013. We announced the first master's program in the space in 2013 when people thought we were talking about nonsense, quite frankly. We had a lot of pressure from our competing universities in the region saying, They've, lo they've gone off the deep end. Why are they even talking about these fake internet money tulip bulbs, let alone bringing them into academia? 
And our assessment then, which is our assessment now, is this is going to be a massive area with tons of huge applications in a lot of areas. So in practice, we've been demoing since 14 on ourselves what I think the key usage cases are in a university. And I think, and I don't want to put a negative spin on this, I think they're more limited than in other industries. Right? So Cyprus is a big shipping and ship management hub. There's a lot of talk about blockchains and shipping and ship management. We're working with industry there. There you're talking about possibly taking out billions and billions and billions of savings per month in a very complicated supply chain. Credentialing has some complications, but it's an easier problem than global supply chains. So we've used it in two ways, and it's interesting because I can now give you three years of feedback on what it means in our operations. The first is we said, well, we're going to accept Bitcoin for tuition. And so it's interesting. Has anyone actually paid? Well, the people who pay are the ones in the digital currency program um, because they tend to be heavily oriented towards uh, cryptocurrency as a field. They are among the most motivated students I've ever seen in my life. And so a very high percentage of them actually pay with Bitcoin. There has been a pseudo remittances usage case, though, however. Um, we have some African students who are on high, online students on high discounts, uh, high scholarships, who are on monthly payment plans because, you know, they're in uh, Zambia or something and they're paying $200 a month because they're on 75% scholarship and they can't pay monthly. And there you're talking about the remittances charges might end up being 20% of their tuition, um, which it's crazy, right? Because it's not a problem you have in the developed world. If you're paying your tuition at MIT, remittances, the payment charges are infinitesimal, right? You don't even think about it. But if you need to send 200 euros 12 times a year from you know, Zambia to Cyprus, uh, the transaction costs eat into it. But it's still a smaller case than the uh, folks in the digital currency program. Now, the other thing we did in spring of 14 we issued the first academic credentials onto the scary Bitcoin blockchain. But fortunately, nothing seems to have happened to us. We're still in good shape. Um, and it was interesting because we did it first as a proof of concept. And we've been running that proof of concept now every term for the students in that program. We've rebuilt it this spring. We'll use it, I think, for our diplomas for the whole graduating class this spring in a more generalized context. I have to tell you, and this is going to sound counter my beliefs, issuing credentials on the blockchain for my graduating students does not solve any massive problems I actually have day to day. Right? Like day to day I worry about retention and attrition and how do we build dorms and how to make sure our programs are competitive. Transcript issuance doesn't end up coming up. Now, it's interesting though, there is a little bit of a problem on the flip side of this, which I think hints at where the future could be. We have a decent intake of international students, maybe 20, 25%. And Cyprus as a whole has an intake, primarily from the developing world. And their document fraud is a serious problem. Um, so in our admissions office, we have, I've heard situations like the following. We rejected the student because someone knew that high school in Nigeria and knew the signature of the principal of that high school and on the transcript we got it was a different signature. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously that's not a scalable system, right? Like recognizing the signatures of principals and the half a million high schools in the world is not how document that's verification the state of the art. that's <laughs> not state of the art. And the Cypriot Ministry of Education has exactly the same problem because they have an issue with some trade schools bringing in fake students. Yeah. And you know, they've asked us, like, what's the actual solution to this? And there's not a great solution to this. Um, it's not as if there's some software as a service uh, system you can plug into that's just going to verify everyone's academic credentials. Because even, you even take the next step. So the ministry says, well, get them apostilled, which is a real nuisance for the students coming in. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in certain countries? The fake documents do, in fact, get apostilled. So you go to someone and uh, they pay a bribe at the point of the apostille, and then it comes apostille. Then you have a really odd scenario because you're looking at the document and it's now coming with a semi-diplomatic 
seal of authenticity and you don't think it's authentic, and then it gets awkward. So it's interesting, I would love it, it would be hugely valuable to me if high schools uh, across the world all had some type of common standard. Realistically, that's going to have to be some type of open standard. Realistically, one of the questions that, you know, Chris and I have spoken many times about this, it's how do you, you know, if we end up with 43 standards, it's not going to be any easier, right? And so I think the key question of how does this actually become useful to the, because the higher education industry as a whole, I, and particularly if you're saying they are being fed by the secondary education industry as a whole, mm -hmm. which now you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of schools, getting everyone to agree on a private blockchain I think is going to be difficult, right? So it probably is going to be in a public blockchain. But then how do you do it in some manner that's interoperable so that you don't assume that every single academic institution in the world right. is going to sign up for the same solution? Yeah. So that's really helpful. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like in part you're saying, at least for credentialing, any one institution doing it, the problem that it solves for them is limited. Yeah. But when you think about it being broadly adopted, then it's pretty transformative in what it, it potentially could mean for processes like international student mobility and credential verification. So I want to push on this, and I, time is flying already. And you know, We've talked a little bit about some of the questions that are coming. But let me play a little bit of devil's advocate here. And um, you know, Chris, maybe you could join. I'll pose this to you, Marley because you don't necessarily live in the world of education every day, so you can bring an outsider's perspective. And then Chris, I'm hoping you can kind of dive in and, and take it as well. Um, as I think about what we've talked about, um, blockchain applies to situations where ownership and control uh, are the same thing. They kind of reside together, of whatever this token or asset is. Transactions are irrevocable, uh, so the pen can't be reversed, um, because everybody wrote it down. They can uh, be revoked. <laughs> well, we're going to get into this, so I want to put, that's why I'm pushing you. Um, the token or asset has a complex, or at least there's a multi-transaction history. You may have given the pen, but if all that stops is then he has the pen forevermore, a little less interesting than if the pen is going to continue down the panel. When I think about a diploma or certificate, I think that the ownership and control of the diploma or the transcript is shared by the university issuing it, as well as the student who earns it. That's part of the the value, mm -hmm. degrees can be revoked and frequently are, and you don't typically, I'm not passing my diploma, I may get a sociology degree, I can't <laughs> give you the sociology degree. There's no <laughs> history of the sociology degree, right? It's just an initial award and that it is forevermore gonna reside with you. So if you think about the blockchain as just a distributed database technology, which I know it's more, because but if you, in layperson, think about that, is, is blockchain really a fit for the attributes that I just described of ownership and control are shared, degrees can be revoked, it's not a frequently transacted item? Like, how do you advise enterprise clients or developers on where the blockchain does solve real problems and where there are simpler, less sexy, perhaps, approaches that get you to the same? So, level? yeah, this is... This Am is I all, making sense here? Yes, absolutely, and I think I have a good answer for you. Um, so the individual attestation of, of someone issuing a uh, verifiable uh, accreditation or um, to, to someone and, and you give it to someone if it's not tied to their identity, it's portable and it's only as good. I mean, I could then sell that to someone else or whatever onto some secondary market. We, we look at these types of systems as not being like the blockchain is just one, one place to record the truth. The actual resolution of the truth can happen in a full stack that has different sets of cryptographic proofs. And if you've ever done PKI, there's something called a, a proof chain or a certificate chain. And you have certificates that are embedded within certificates, embedded with certificates. And we have this notion, the same thing in blockchains. We call them uh, signature onions, if you will. But they're essentially, you have some essential thing that you need to attest to, uh, some a diploma or uh, cert certification or owner ownership of a stock or something. And it, it will be digitally signed using the same cryptographic technique. And then it would go through another level of attestation. That would get digitally signed. And each signature builds on the next to build a, a trust chain. And at the bottom, you have this, this sort of onion. And then anyone that's trying to validate it will be able to validate each, uh, each layer independently. And each layer could be uh, validated uh, in different ways. Uh, the example would be, um, so if, if you have a self-sovereign identity that you have um, that you have control over, that you own, it's your, 
your, your identity and your, all your health care records are there. You, you provide those. But also my university provides an attestation that I graduated with this degree, I'm a, a BS and whatever, and it's attested to my identity. Um, and then um, I can start to get my bank uh, attest to my identity because I have bank accounts and I start building these things up. Then you have this composite set of proofs that make the, the entire system much more secure and stable. Or one individual piece of fraud, because it doesn't completely eliminate fraud, just like somebody could like, bribe somebody and, and, and get bad data into the system. Um, but we think that, that uh, putting it in a larger ecosystem will weed that stuff out over time. Um, but yeah, we, we start to tell people about those. It's not just one set of cryptographic principles. Right. We're applying the, the math essentially at multiple levels. Um, and it sounds like what you're saying in part is also, don't necessarily think about the transaction history of the asset as the vector. The vector is also the individual, their identity, and the different transactions that represent their comprehensive profile. Yes, full of assets lineage. and identities. No. And so you can kind of turn it in both directions. Correct. So Chris, I got you animated. That was my goal. <laughs> um, you know, Learning Machine is, is really the leader in talking about and developing actual open standards and tools for applying blockchain to credentialing. Um, I personally learned a lot from you, so thank you. Uh, so I, I, I got you riled up when I said that you can't revoke things on the blockchain, at least without a little bit of a side process that you could argue maybe isn't pure blockchain, but I could be wrong. So can you talk a little bit about how the blockchain gets applied to credentialing and go back maybe to the question I asked Marley, but now answer it very concretely. If a university or school here wants to issue a credential uh, you know, written to the blockchain, how does that work? What are the components of it? Uh, what are the trade-offs? Yeah. And the answer overlaps with the previous question, which okay. is, is this an appropriate framework or infrastructure uh, to, for academic credentials? And so I'd like to get out of the weeds a little bit and, and say, think of it like this. The um, recording a transaction of, of, of money, if I give you a dollar, that's a transaction that can be time stamped and recorded. If I give you a diploma, that's a document that has value and it's a transaction. I gave it to you. And so that can be time stamped, recorded on the blockchain, uh, and checked later for ver to, be, to verify that it hasn't changed since I gave it to you, that you haven't messed with it. Um, that it can be verified that I gave it, it, it checks who the issuer was and who the recipient was. Um, and so it's actually one of the few use cases that maps perfectly to the infrastructure of the blockchain, um, academic credentialing. So when I say we help institutions issue academic records in a way that is tamper-proof, recipient-owned, and instantly verifiable, people squint a little bit and go, that sounds a little bit like a magic trick. Like, I, the reason they want to understand how it works is the same reason we want a magic trick explained. It sounds awesome, but mechanically, how does it work? Because it's not magic. And so without any visuals and without getting too technical, uh, let me try to take you through it a little bit. And let's start with the digital document, right? Uh, records are becoming digitized which is a great step forward, right? They can be inscribed with metadata, they can be read by machines, they can, they're more convenient, they can generate analytics. So that's our starting point. We, we get all that stuff that we start with. But now cryptography, which is an old, I mean, it's been around forever, uh, provides techniques for taking that digital record and compressing it down into a, a single string of numbers and letters um, called a hash. And this represents the document's unique fingerprint. No other document has this hash. If you were to change one letter of the data, or even one pixel in an image it contains, it would generate an entirely new hash. So that's nothing new, actually. Um, the, the question is, where do you store that hash, that string of numbers? Because no private, you're not putting student records on the blockchain. You're never revealing any private information. The only thing that's going on the blockchain is this hash. So traditionally, you would store this hash with a centralized authority that would be consulted later for verification. So if you try to use a record in the world, a centralized authority would have to be consulted and say, hey, does the hash on this thing match the hash that you're storing? That's often a time-consuming uh, uh, time process, complicated. 
So what's new is we now have this blockchain, this decentralized network of computers that can store this hash. And, any, and, and anyone can check the blockchain. And ver so if I give you a document, uh, anyone can check the blockchain and verify who issued it, who received it, and that it hasn't been tampered with. And, and that can happen between strangers. It can happen across sovereign borders. Um, and so it creates a huge level of, of convenience, uh, particularly for the verifiers. Um, but then it also has a lot of security benefits. So it, a centralized authority is a single point of failure. So when you replace that with a decentralized network where, the, where all of these transactions have been stored all over the world across a, a network that no company or government owns that can't be easily tampered with or taken down, you have a much more robust infrastructure for protecting against loss of records. In the Syrian refugee crisis, we have five million people that have been displaced and lost their identity because their institutions are gone. That shouldn't happen. We have the technology to prevent that now. Okay. And I've heard you use the metaphor of like a receipt from a grocery store. What's stored on the blockchain is more analogous to the receipt. Yeah, it's the just date, proof. The time stamp, who issued it, who hash. received it, when it happened, right. and some other information. In the case of money, it's how much. In the case of an academic record, it's the hash of the document. And then the actual record itself is not stored on the blockchain. Right. It and can no be one, transmitted in the clear. And no one can ever see it unless a student chooses to disclose it to someone specifically. So it has great privacy properties. Got it. So Alex, I want to bring you in. Antonis introduced this idea, which I guess I don't want to abuse the TCP analogy. But if one computer uses TCP, it's a lot less interesting than right. you know, if there's a network. <laughs> the fax machine. You know, so um, Antonis introduced this idea that in and of itself, limited problems would scale it up to a system, a country, broader, things get interesting. You're a country level thinker. So can you talk a little bit about what the implications of blockchain for credentialing and beyond are from a nation state perspective? Okay, um, nation states are big words, okay? Nation states are run by people. <laughs> so that's the first point. Um, it, it's not an accident that you've got somebody from Cyprus and somebody from Malta here. Okay, so you've got two small islands and we're a long way from home. But normally these small places tend to be, I think both our countries have aspirations and a bit of a history of being island labs, trying out new things, seeing opportunities when, uh, when uh, none might exist. I, I'll, I'll use an analogy, maybe not a very elegant analogy. About 15 years ago um, in this country, uh, to protect the offline casino business, um, suddenly online gaming was made illegal overnight. Two countries went for that market. It was Malta and Gibraltar. Okay, now, irrespective of the morals related to that industry, I mean, that's fed a lot of people in my country for the last 15 years, and it turned Malta into, a, into an international place. If you look at as, as a test bed for new technologies, I mean, I had broadband before my mates in London had broadband. Because again, when you look at suppliers, infrastructure suppliers, they tend to look at these places. Because in a way, if you muck up, you're mucking up with a small confined space. Yeah. But all of these small places have all the complexities in terms of topology, demographics that, that larger places have. Now, if I want to drill down into the, in a, a way, a piece of action research, which is, which is happening now, and I have two hats. One is because I'm, I'm very much involved in looking at uh, block certs and block certs in education and trying to, trying to make that work on the basis of four pilots that, that we have, but also within an EU context. Okay? Again, it's not an accident. Malta right now has the EU presidency till the 30th of June. There's a lot of eyes and ears related to us. And of course, strategically, a small country looks at new things. So we've been planning this for, for a, a while. Let, let me dive into what happens on a nation state basis when, you, when trying to get something done. You're looking at anything from the office of the prime minister to three different ministers to what we call permanent secretaries getting involved, i.e. these are the guys who head up the ministries. The CTOs, the CIOs within those ministries, and I haven't even started to dive into CEOs of universities, rectors, all the way down to you know, registrars, and then you flip it, and you think of the most important component in this, and that's the learner. That normally is, is, is forgotten along the wayside. So what we're, we're doing right now, 
And this is when you start looking at things like, what's in it for me is being asked by everybody from prime minister down all the way down <coughs> to the learner, why should I do this? And I think the privilege we have right now is we're drilling down onto the basis of registrars with certificates and saying, this is what we have right now. How can you improve my life? Can you make my life easier? And then you start looking at things, whether it's just analytics or speed. Remember, we're looking at things here, trust, right? Trust between what, uh, you know, public identities? You know, governments all say they want to be more open, but are they, really? So we, we're really drilling into the nitty gritty of trying to, to add value to all of these different components within the supply chain. In our case, we had to make a strategic decision, which maybe may not be relevant to larger countries, but when we, when we started looking at block certs, what was compelling for us, we were looking at something where the kernel is an open standard. So if the University of Malta wanted to go in and, and, and plonk 25 PhDs to build on that standard, they could do that. In our case, because it's small, pragmatic, and let's get something done, it made much more sense partnering up with, in our case, with Learning Machine, who had a, had a commercial uh, uh, application and something which is ready to go. But it's, it's real life now, right now, and I think what's, what's exciting is, is the kind of pilots that we're looking at. So we're looking from people in tourism to the National Commission for Further and Higher Education, which is the higher, highest institution in the land. I mean, you spoke about Syria. One of the things we're looking at, pragmatics. You know, we're on the uh, migrant trail, okay? People escaping from sub-Saharan Africa and trying to get to a better life. And some of these people end up in Malta, okay? So what happens when somebody shows up and says, I'm a doctor? You know, how can you accredit these things? So we, we're, we're looking at some really interesting applications, practical applications. But like any other places, we are also looking at bottom line, trust, triangulating all the information that we have, and speaking to the European Union at the same time. So there are 26 countries looking at us right now, trying to see how this thing works. Wow. That's where we are. So, and you brought up something that I think kind of shows a failing for me as a moderator so far, which is the learner. Because I don't think we have fully communicated how big an idea it is for the individual, the consumer, the learner to fully have control and ownership over their credentials and records independent. So let me ask sort of a general panel question. Um, so who wins and who loses in a world where blockchain is at scale being used to register credentials and make them tamper evident, if not tamper proof? Um, you know, I think in the US we have the National Student Clearing House, which is this big repository of data that every university publishes into to track enrollment, degree verification. We have student information systems who a big part of their value is being the store of these records and to differing degrees put toll gates on them or view that as a pole position play, place to play within an enterprise as being, you know, you think in a talent management world, if all of my different education and professional um, credentialing is being done across organizations, those systems are getting disintermediated in a certain way. So can you talk, let's talk a little disruption. Who wins and who loses in a world with that kind of um, public permanent registry of my credentials and my talent record? And maybe you can kick us well, off. Well, I think in, in a um, utopian sense, um, it's the good guys, and it's, it's, the, it's the little guys, it's the learners, right? They all think they're good. They all think they're good guys, but it's the sense of being, and, I, and what I mean by this is not being, because um, the question sounds like you're, you're implying it's for who wins in terms of which companies. I'm actually saying the learners Just, win, right? Yeah. It's, it's the individual. Uh, and it's the individual who's supposedly an honest individual. So, I mean, I, I, I tend to often describe the broad benefits. I, I'm very interested in the developing world and, and financial inclusion and problems like that. And I often describe the broad benefits of the blockchain as proving who I am, what I've done, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and what I have. So my assets, my past, and, my, and myself. And, and once we've got that as something that's self-sovereign and in my control, it's an incredibly empowering thing because it's, it's such a huge barrier to entry around the world in so many aspects. So loads of people don't have bank accounts because they can't prove that they're a reliable participant right. in the financial system. There are loads of people who can't get a job because they can't be credentialed and so forth. So the very idea of empowering at that level it changes the game, and it also it doesn't just change the game in saying, okay, now more people can have bank accounts, now more people can participate in the global economy. It literally is a force of innovation, because now you have so many more people who can confidently participate, giving the one thing that they can own, which is their data and their sense of self and their skills, and apply that 
in a way that they know they can trust that they're not going to be abused. So the win is for these individuals, I would say the win is really sort of open permissionless innovation, which is a very generic and broad concept, but hopefully we all get better off because of that. And it sounds like you almost, by analogy, think of it as the way broadband just opens up yeah. all of these applications on the internet, it, blockchain opens up. It, it's an open platform. A whole level of participation yeah. in all types of online experiences yeah, I don't like and the word services losers. that we have in I think, uh, I think there's, there's winners and there's new opportunities. Uh, for the incumbents to expand. Well, I think technology always has winners. Well, you have, <laughs> you look at this, this is one technology, it comes around about every 10, 15 years, and this is one that we see institutions, large and small, fall into two buckets. We have the fear bucket, and we have the greed bucket. <laughs> and the fear bucket are the ones that look at what the technology can do that can remove their importance if they are seen to be adding friction to a process, so it's um, clearing houses, like in the financial services space, it's the DTCC, you just named one about student records. Yeah. Um, and the, you have these large centralized aggregation points that can be uh, decomposed, if you will, and, and, and democratized, uh, then to open it up as a broader platform. And when we look at, at those, uh, the people that fall in the fear bucket don't realize the opportunity until they they step back a bit from that immediate, oh my gosh, this is gonna kill my business, um, or it's gonna, you know, but they can't fight it. Um, they have to then step back and say, well, there's a larger opportunity for me to, to, to take this out. So we, use, we call it creative destruction, um, but it's essentially that, uh, the ability to, to see that the disruption is creating these opportunities at the individual level. Uh, ultimately, everybody in this room will benefit because um, it will allow us to do peer-to-peer -peer things that we could never do before, um, but also institutions will as well. Okay, so we're gonna start landing this airplane, and again, if you weren't here to hear, if Michael walks out, it's nothing that I said or anyone else said. It might be, though. Uh, no, it might be. Uh, what he told me is he has a very tight time frame uh, to get to uh, a flight. But let me come back to uh, Annis and Chris. Can you talk now a little bit about the state of play Give us some very, very concrete, specific examples of universities, school districts, whatever the right tier is of issuers who are using the blockchain in how they issue their, issue their credentials. Right. Well, I think the state of play is about to start getting interesting. We were off by ourselves in the wilderness for a couple years, I feel. So we issued our first certificates in 2014, and then things were very quiet, honestly, until Chris and his firm came along. And so we're moving now to diplomas and transcripts. I think I'll let Chris talk about his clients, but I think some of his clients are starting to now come online into production. And so now we'll start seeing the first actual activity in the space that, um, and then the question's gonna be, I'm gonna go back to what I had said before, which is it's a very important question for us to all get right, either in education specifically, or more broadly on this question of authenticated documents into the blockchain. Because <clears throat> some level of some layer needs to be agreed upon. Uh, and if we can do that, you'll get the network dynamics working for everyone, right? A lot of people will use firms like Chris's. Other people will say, yeah, we'll put some PhDs on it and do it. There'll be five years from now, 20 people doing these types of things. And if they can interoperate, then you'll have something useful. If it ends up being, uh, they, they're out there, you could verify them if you follow the specs of each vendor and each software platform, you're yeah. actually going to replicate what's happening now with SISs, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, that's right. where you'll end up. Absolutely. It's just with a more, I don't know, tamper resistant or uh, civil war resistant underlying infrastructure. That's well said. And, and to, you know, our initial goal was ubiquity. How do we drive ubiquity of a standards-driven future of this technology? So throughout 2016, we worked with MIT to develop the open source standard called Block Certs. And MIT was actually issuing certificates to Media Lab members throughout 2016. Um, now in 2017, we're, ro we're rolling out commercial pilots. Um, and it, uh, without naming everyone, it spans across school systems, companies, and governments. So one example of each is MIT will be issuing diplomas uh, to their graduates this June. Uh, a company is Inter-American Bank, is using it for workforce development. 
And then a country is the Republic of Malta, uh, which has a lot of eyes on it and has already begun lots of conversations with other countries that are looking to uplift their infrastructure. And what would be different for a student at MIT who has a diploma that has been registered, for lack of a better term, on the blockchain than if they had gotten a PDF version? Well, one, they can... What would they appreciate as the difference? Or am they I may getting not back into the trap again about, you know, someone has to be first and you have to get to a certain yeah. level of scale yeah. to... They may not fully appreciate it. I mean, the fact they do own it, and they can cryptographically. Right. So they'd appreciate the registrar can't charge them again. If right. They, <laughs> they can prove it. But there's also benefits. It's not just for the students. MIT has some selfish motivations right. to protect their brand. Yeah. You know, you've got yeah. lots mm -hmm. of people pretending to have graduated from MIT, yeah. and this yeah. provides a format. They actually see this as the future of their real diploma because it's a format that can't be faked. I mean. Um, we, we were often tell the story we were trying to like embrace this this idea and talk about it, it was the Kenyan elections of a, a few years ago uh, and they decided to check up on the claims of their educational backgrounds of all the candidates and something like 56 percent or something of all of them had sort of falsely claimed to have a Harvard or MIT or, or yeah. Columbia degree right so the, so the benefits are really diffuse it's 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 partly uh, it's certainly the brands of those institutions who for whom it's very important the integrity of that record is maintained but it's also the countries the reliability of their systems of democracy it's it's businesses it's really an it's a broad public infrastructure question and this is actually a, this comes up time and time again with with blockchain technologies it's like the benefits are really quite diffuse and and so how you monetize, how you win, who wins, it's, it's, it's complicated. But there's a lot of real tangible stuff that's beneficial. Great. Thank you. Were you? Uh, I mean, we're we here speaking with, within an education paradigm, OK? But I'll, I'll give you two, two flip coins to this. One is, you know, we're almost implying there are no downsides. The downside is everybody has to be educated in the supply chain. So I'm having conversations with the data protection commissioner in my country, who's not necessarily the easiest person on the planet. and so. He, too, has to come up to speed on, on the benefits that there are here. And people's instinct normally is, oh, well, in that case, we'll have a private blockchain. You're trying to say, no, it's actually more secure than a public blockchain, for instance. Okay, some people may or may disagree with, 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 with that option. But when you start scaling this up, and again, it goes back to countries. I'm looking at my country, which ranks, I think, number two in terms of e-government in, in, in Europe. People are already saying, you know, so we can go from certificates within an academic paradigm to debt, birth, marriages, certificates. Now, if you, if you look at some of these cultures, if you live in Italy, you go and queue up for, you know, to, to get any kind of certificate. So if you flip this, that's why these pilots are so important, okay? And that's why people are watching everybody to see how, how it works. So I, I think we live in very exciting times. I, I think what's going to be interesting is, is this thing going to go, is there a tipping point? that will reach where suddenly everything goes? Or are people going to wait, I guess, for five years, six years? Or is there some other tsunami standard coming on from somewhere? I think that's, that's where we are right now. OK. So I think we're going to use that as an opportunity to close. I very specifically did not ask about public versus private or permission-based blockchain, because I think with a minute and 50 seconds, that would be a hard. <laughs> if explaining the blockchain would be hard, um, that would certainly be even harder. But some of the panelists can stay afterwards. I welcome everyone to come up and ask questions. And please join me in thanking them for a great discussion about blockchain and credentialing.